Bible talks about an antichrist. Mm -hmm. Now, for many people who may not know, can you tell us exactly what that term actually means, antichrist? Yeah, a lot of people use the English uh, definition of anti, meaning against. And the word antichrist, in a sense, does mean against, but actually what it means, the word anti in the original language means one who would take the place of Christ, not one who's trying to necessarily openly fight against, but one who would attempt to take the place or replace Christ upon the earth. That's what it, it means. You know, I remember when I was becoming a Christian, I decided to watch some Christian prophecy movies. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. They described, uh, you know, the Antichrist, this, this villain of scripture that shows up would be, would come from Satan sleeping with some woman. Right, right, right. And uh, there'd be this child that would be born that would do all sorts of things. What does the Bible actually teach about this figure? Well, you know, to comment on what you just said, you know, you, you have this picture of this guy who's smiling at the masses and he smiles and his, and his teeth kind of twinkle and then he turns away from them and his eyes like turn red. Yeah, lizard or eyes or yeah, something. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> you've seen the same you, you, movie? Yeah, I've seen the same movie. <laughs> so that's not quite the picture that the Bible describes. Uh, the Bible describes, you know, the Antichrist, it calls it a beast in Daniel 7 it describes it as a little horn or a little nation. In the book of Revelation chapter 13, it describes it as a beast power, which is also a nation, the Bible describes. So this would be actually a political religious power that would rise up according to Daniel historically. And then according to the book of Revelation, it would exist prophetically at the end of time. So we're not talking about a person we're talking about a system, an entity that has existed for a long time upon the earth, exists really today when you study it thoroughly, and will continue to exist until the end of time. It has the eyes like the eyes of a man, so it does have a man that leads it, but that man in and of itself is not the Antichrist. The Antichrist is the system or the entity. What's the big problem with the Antichrist? Well, uh, the Bible uh, gives many descriptions of what the problem is. Uh, this power would, you know, resist the things that God has set up. Uh, for instance, the, the ministry of Christ, the understanding of salvation, the understanding of the character of God. It would misrepresent it while at the same time kind of representing it. And so it would portray a picture of God that people could accept, but it wasn't quite accurate. And so in addition to that, you know, there's a number of theological errors, doctrines that have been represent, misrepresented down through time that, you know, I'll just give you a perfect example of one. This system kind of developed the idea of, of hellfire and eternal hellfire. Now the Bible does talk about hell, but a misunderstanding of that has made more atheists than just about any other teaching of the Bible. And so, you know, I bump into atheists all the time. They say, well, if God's gonna be like this and burn people forever and ever just for a short amount of time on the earth, that seems unfair to me, and it is. And really, that's not the, the God that B the Bible portrays. So this system has been established and it has really led people astray from the truth of the Bible and really developed a false picture of God and Jesus in their minds. Does the system play a role at the very end? Oh, very much so. Uh, it talks about in the book of Revelation 17, Revelation 13, that it unites itself. You know, our, our nation has been established on the separation of church and state. But the Bible says at the end of time, it will attempt to unite those together and will be successful and really force upon the world uh, a worship that is contrary to what God portrays in the Bible. And so it plays a very active role. It will play a role in the lives of every person on the earth and uh, have an impact for sure. And, and if you study prophecy and you watch what's happening in the world today, you see that really it's right on track. And it's, it's really amazing to see how accurate the Bible is and the details it gives. Wes, you've described this Antichrist power being this kind of religious power. You've described it as starting off small, but then grows. You've described it as being something that introduces error. Mm -hmm. You've described it as something that 
looks like biblical Christianity, but isn't. You've also described it playing an end time role in, in, in regards to a conflict over worship. Who is this? Who is it? <laughs> what is this? Well, I could tell you right now, and probably half of our audience may have already figured that out. The Bible gives very specific points. In Daniel, uh, I'm sorry, in Daniel chapter 7, there's about 10 different points. In Revelation 13, there's a number of points given again that are really repeated. When you study those and you see them played out in history, it becomes very clear that there's only one power on the earth that could fulfill that. And I'd love to tell our watchers this, but I think they ought to try to study that for themselves. <laughs> Okay, I got one more question for you, Wes, and that is this. If somebody is starting to study out Bible prophecy, they want to study out the Bible, how should they begin? Just by reading the books of Daniel and Revelation. And I almost guarantee you, you're not going to really understand what's going on there. Following that, um, there's a number of resources that can and help you. I had a set of Bible study lessons that really kind of pinpoint and guide the way. And you know, it's not man-made things that are pointing you man's way. It lets the Bible speak for itself. And it, and it lets, it points you to the places where the Bible will unlock the symbols. People can go back to the scriptures. You can go and back to themselves. the Bible. It's a Bible study. Mm -hmm. And that was most helpful to me. And I know that I think you have some available for people. God has given us that map all the way through time because he doesn't want his people to be ignorant. He doesn't want us to be left in the dark. He wants us to have the light, to have the truth, and to know that he's a God who cares. You know, many of the historic event, events that people have seen throughout history, you know, the French Revolution being one where modern atheism was born, uh, all that was revealed in the Bible, in the book of Revelation. And nothing has caught God by surprise. Atheism didn't catch God by surprise. There was actually a prophecy in the book of Revelation chapter 11 that reveals the birth of modern atheism and the events that led up to that. And so in a very clear way, God spells these things out. And so if we, if we look to God, if we give God a chance, if we let the Bible speak to our hearts, we'll find answers. I found answers and look, I don't know that there probably was a, a more skeptical person than myself, mm. but I found the answers and you can too. That's beautiful and that's exciting. We've been talking about prophecies in the Bible with Wes Peppers. When we get back, we're going to our live audience to take their questions, so don't go anywhere. Welcome back to Hope at Night. We've been diving into the world of Bible prophecy after hearing Wes's incredible story on how Bible prophecy literally turned his life around. Does anyone have any question for Wes today? Right over there. What can you advise to the people who read the Bible, but it doesn't speak to them? I would say there's been times in my own life, even as a Christian, when I've read the Bible and I'm like, man, I'm just not feeling it today. I'm just not, you know, connecting. And I would say, number one, pray. You always want to pray and ask God to speak something that's meaningful to you. Number two, um, sometimes, you know, I realize that I'm distracted. And so there may be things happening in my life that I just need to, 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 to stop, take a deep breath and, and get those things out of my head. Sometimes I just need to say, you know what, I'm not, I'm going to leave this area here and go over here to another place. So I'll pray about what area should I go to. And, you know, the Bible is amazing because you could read the same passage today as you do tomorrow, but today you have some kind of experience in your life and that passage is going to speak differently to you tomorrow. I always kind of compare it to working out. You know, when you work out, uh, if, you, if you've never worked out in your life and you start working out, the first time you do it, you're going to be sore, you're going to be struggling, you're going to be tired, you're going to think, do I really want to keep doing this? But the more you do it, the more muscle you build. The more that you read the Bible, the clearer it becomes. You gain more spiritual insight. You start thinking more spiritually. God starts speaking to your heart. So my biggest thing would be keep at it. Pray, ask God to help you open it up. 
and, and, and just don't give up, don't give up. Write down things that are meaningful to you, revisit those things from time to time, and I promise you God will begin speaking to you very clearly. That's practical. Any other questions? How was it for you to forgive your dad and how has God helped you on your path to forgiveness? When I first had that argument with my dad and told him I didn't want to see him ever again, uh, I, I struggled with that for a long time. I was bitter, I was angry. But as I began to study the Bible and I began to see the love of God and how God had forgiven me so many times for so many things, I realized I needed to forgive my, get, my dad. So I went to him and I said, Dad, I want you to know that God has made a huge change in my life. My heart is softer than it used to be. And I want you to know that I forgive you for the things that you've done to our family. That wasn't easy, it was a struggle because there was a lot of pain going on in my heart. And you know, uh, that pain had not, had been started to heal really, but it wasn't gone. It wasn't driven by a feeling. It wasn't some emotion where I felt these warm fuzzies for my dad, but it was a conscious choice I had to make. I said, if God can forgive me, because there's nothing worse that my dad did to me or anyone did to me than what I had done to God. And so I said, if God can forgive me, I can choose to forgive him. And so when that happened, I felt like God just kind of put a thought in my mind, kind of nudged me a little bit. And I said, Dad, not only do I forgive you, but I want to ask you to forgive me. And that was a huge step to our healing. For the first time in my life, I saw my dad cry. But that healing began to take place. We have a good relationship today. And uh, my dad is not a Christian yet. He's making steps. And I'm thankful for that. I'm praying for him. You guys can pray for him as well. It's beautiful. Any other questions? The printing press was invented around 1440 AD. Prior to then, the Bible was passed down through oral tradition and written and rewritten countless times. Is it possible that these prophecies were added later on? And is it possible that what we are seeing unfold today are, is the result of self-fulfilling prophecies? There's evidence, there is ancient manuscripts that have been discovered that, uh, you know, validify the, uh, that the writing was written when it was claimed to have been written. And, you know, when they were translating the Bible, when they were copying it, people think that it was done carelessly, but it, a great and deep care was taken as they did that. There were usually multiple people that were doing the, either the translating or the copying, and they, they would check it and recheck it. And if it had any error, even the slightest error, like for instance, if they just didn't cross the T or dot the I, they shredded it and they started over until it was absolutely perfect. So the claims today that many people make, oh, well, it's been mistranslated or been whatever, whatever, those claims are really laid in the dust. And when you look at the number of manuscripts we have from ancient times, and so forth, when you do the comparison and the test of historicity, you find that the Bible is not simply one of the most accurate books of history, it's actually the most accurate book from history. It, it's amazing to me that the, the claims are made that these prophecies had to have been written after the fact because they're so clear and so accurate. When you start digging into that ancient history, it's more compelling than you even think it might be. Any other questions? You described the Antichrist as a system and an entity rather than just one person. So do you believe that this system is alive in today's society? And if so, what is it? Yeah, 100%. It's existing right now. And if I were to say it, everybody would know it. You know, the, um, the amazing points that it makes makes it really undeniable. You know, it's a, it's a system that would arise in ancient times. It was a religious power, but it also was heavily involved in the nations of the world. It's led by one person. It claims to have the authority uh, to even change God's laws. Um, it would persecute uh, the people of God throughout history. It would uh, rule for a very specific amount of time that the Bible describes. Uh, there's a number of things that the Bible speaks of to, to describe this power. Now, I know everybody wants me to reveal it here, 
but I want to encourage you to study it for yourself. And, and it's not that I'm afraid to or that I don't have the answer. I, I know what the answer is, but it can be a bit sensitive for people. So we want people to find it out for themselves. We have some study guides that can help you with that. When you look at the clarifying points, uh, there have been very few people that didn't, weren't able to name it right away. So it's very obvious and clear, so I'll leave it at that. You know, Wes, what you're, you're doing by also not just telling us the answer here is you're telling us to find our answers from the scriptures. That's it. Which I think is really important because the fact that there are so many theories regarding the Antichrist mm -hmm. is because people yeah. aren't looking at w actually what the text is saying verbatim about this issue. That's right. It, it amazes me how many people will read books about the Bible and not actually read the Bible itself. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so we want you to dig deep. And if you study it, you look at it, you'll find the answer very clearly. Tremendous. Awesome. Any other questions? Are there any theories about when the second coming of Christ will be? And could it happen in our lifetime? There's lots of theories. People have been setting dates for hundreds of years. And uh, the truth is, you know, some people ask, how do we know that we're any closer now than we were when the Roman Empire fell? Well, there's a chapter, Matthew chapter 24, where Jesus gives a lot of compelling signs. He talks about natural disasters, wars and rumors of wars, and all kinds of things that would increase both in intensity and in frequency just before the return of Christ. And he says, when you see these things happen, know that it's near even at the door. But Jesus himself actually said, no man knows the day or the hour. So we don't know exactly when Jesus is going to come. There's no evidence for a specific time, but we can know the season. And when you look at those prophecies, look at those events, we can tell very clearly that we're in the season. So could it happen in our lifetime? I very much believe it could. Will it? I don't know for sure. But if not in our lifetime, very near after it. With this understanding that Jesus is coming soon, what should be our response? Our response should be, am I ready? If this is all real, and I believe it is, the evidence is there, what's my standing with God? How do I know that, that I'd be ready for that event and what does it mean to be ready? And the Bible gives answers to all those things. And I think there's some personal responsibility because Look, friends, there is nothing greater in the heart of God than that we would spend eternity with Him. And God is not the enemy. He's our friend. We say, well, why are we in all this difficult situation? God didn't cause it. Really, when you study the Bible, you find that we caused it. But God has made the way of escape. He's made the way for us to pass out of this pain and suffering world that we've experienced that he didn't create, he created a good world and he's made the way for us. So if we w would be willing to examine ourselves and say, maybe God does have the answers, maybe God does provide the way and there's something more to this life than just me and I think you'll find a good positive answer to that. That's right. Any other questions? How do the Bible prophecies explain events in Asian, African, American countries, civilizations, and empires? Some of the main prophecies of Scripture describe events that impact certain areas of the world. And so the Bible doesn't speak about every country, but a number of African countries, Ethiopia, Egypt, the Bible does talk about. Um, there are some, you know, it refers to Asia as well in the Bible. In the book of Revelation, in Revelation chapter 13, it speaks about the United States. And, uh, you know, some people, wow, that's amazing. But when you look at the points describing one of those powers, it, it very clearly speaks to that. The beauty of the Bible is that it reaches across every culture. It reaches across every race, every economic status. It reaches people that are, you know, in slavery. It reaches people that are kings and emperors. And it speaks to every human heart. And God has a plan, and, and, and that plan is revealed. No, I'm sorry if, you know, maybe Canada is not mentioned in the Bible. <laughs> not every country is mentioned, but every country is included in the sense that God wants all to be saved. And the fact that the Bible says that the gospel goes to every nation, every tribe, nation. tongue, and people tells us There'll be people from every country That's that will right. respond to his 
his message of, of hope and, and salvation to them. Yeah, he, he doesn't just give the invitation to every nation, but to every individual. Right. And that's what's special, makes it personal for us. Right, and so when you look at the Old Testament, there's such an emphasis on the nation of Israel. Yeah. So what was God doing in those other nations? Yeah, God was working as well. You find many stories in the Bible of individuals from other nations that came uh, to him and a knowledge of him. But also with the nation of Israel, it wasn't God's intention that, that Israel was the only nation he acknowledged and loved and cared about. But God wanted Israel to be a light to all the other nations. He wanted them to carry his message of hope and love to every nation upon the earth and that the other nations would come to a knowledge of God and an acceptance of God because of the example of the Israelites. Unfortunately, they kind of messed that up, but God still reaches the world with his message, even though humanity may fail at, at uh, the delivery of that sometimes. That's right. Any other questions? Right over there. Wes, how much time should one spend studying the Bible if you're just starting out? I would encourage somebody who's starting out to start with the Gospel of John. That's my favorite Gospel. It's a beautiful book. But how much time is really up to the individual. And the advice I always give people is, is spend as much time until you feel at peace that you've connected with God. That's the answer. For some, that may be an hour. For some, it may be five minutes. For some, it'll be an hour today and 10 minutes tomorrow. But spend the time that you feel you need to be there in the presence of God. Same goes for praying as well. You know, you, you don't, it's just, there's no real formula. The formula is God speaking to your heart. That's the answer I would say. <laughs> Wes, thank you so much for taking thank us you. through this journey of the Bible and Bible prophecy. It's Absolutely. been enlightening and exciting. Yes. There's a whole lot more to learn, so be sure to check out our free resource site at hope.study slash hope at night for specific Bible study guides on prophecies. Why not take the time to prayerfully open your Bible and allow God to reveal His truth to you? You won't regret it. As we've discovered, Bible prophecy isn't just about foretelling the future, it's about transforming lives today. Through prophecies in the Bible, God has given us a roadmap to understanding God's plan for our world and our place in it. Even when the world around us seems chaotic, Bible prophecies give us confidence that God is in control. And knowing that definitely can give you hope at night. Take care and we'll see you.